everyone, and welcome to another episode where we bring in someone in the sustainability industry to talk more about their career path. And so today we do have Tyler, and we did go to the same college, but I don't think we knew each other at the same time when we went to the same college. And so really happy that he's here today. And so, hi, Tyler. Can you please introduce yourself a bit and maybe tell us what you do for work? Sure. Hi, Tiana. It's been great to connect and I'm so happy to be here today and chat about careers with you. I think it's crazy that we didn't meet while at UC Irvine. I wish we did, but I'm glad we get to connect now. And for everyone else, my name is Tyler Valdez. I use he, him pronouns. I am based in unceded Kumeyaay lands in San Diego, and I work with the California Environmental Justice Alliance, also known as SEHA, on the Solar on Multifamily Affordable Housing Program, also known as SOMA, so lots of acronyms. Um, and I really support the program implementation, working on administration, uh, marketing, education, outreach efforts, really ensuring that the program is serving and benefiting environmental justice communities. And for some people out there who probably aren't sure about what SOMA is, can you explain yeah. a little bit about it? Yeah, definitely. So essentially, like to kind of bring it all back to like the bigger picture, uh, what's happened is we have this booming solar industry in California. A lot of folks or people living in California might know that, um, but it's been mostly benefiting uh, single family homeowners, uh, typically in affluent uh, and white communities. And really there's been a, a, a disparity between access to rooftop solar between those communities and working class, low income communities of color. And so that are also renters. And so there's been this inequitable access to solar and that's through systemic racism, um, inequitable solar policy design, um, and just the workings of the industry. Um, and so um, community, community members of environmental justice communities came together, raised their voice and advocated for a piece of legislation called Assembly Bill 693, which was uh, passed in law, passed in law in 2015 and became what it, it basically created the SOMA program and it also funded the program. And so that program has the mission of basically increasing access uh, to solar and its benefits for uh, low income communities and what the state calls disadvantaged communities. And those are also known as environmental justice communities or EJ communities, which are census tracts that have the highest levels of um, being overburdened by pollution and also other uh, socio and economic factors that make them more vulnerable um, to harmful impacts of hazardous pollution. And so, yeah, that's the program. And it's been around only for around three or four years uh, for implementation. And it's administered by a group of nonprofit organizations, including the Grid Alternatives, the Association for Energy Affordability and the California Housing Part for Housing Partnership, and uh, there's a team of community-based organizations, also known as CBOs, which includes uh, groups like Seha and others um, that really support the program and its design and its an in, in its implementation. <laughs> that's a little tongue twister, but yeah. So that's the Sol Soma program in a nutshell. No, that's, that's so cool. And I feel like this is something that people don't really talk about a lot, honestly. Mm. Like how does yeah. like climate change not just affect um, regions, but what about more on the community level? And so I'm so happy that you're sharing this because I, yeah. mm, the only reason why I know a little more about it is because I had like a fellowship that was doing kind of like the same thing where we were trying to um, market and communicate to communities of low income that, hey, you know, there's rebates and subsidies out there for you to buy energy efficient technologies for your home. Um, mm -hmm. But I do feel like if I wasn't ever in that program, that's something that I wouldn't have known, honestly. And so I'm so happy that you're able to share this. And so um, I would be really interested to understand maybe like what your typical day looks like at your work because I know you mentioned some marketing like education and so maybe you can touch upon that a little more yeah well I think like a lot of folks in this space um the days vary and I do work remotely from home um and what a typical day could look like you know it, it really depends on like where we are um and certain elements of the program but really it could be anything from conducting property owner outreach so 
reaching out to the people that would be ultimately the decision makers on whether or not the solar gets onto the rooftops of multifamily affordable housing, um, informing them about the program, gaining their interest, building trust, and, and ultimately encouraging them to apply for the program if their buildings are eligible. Uh, also working with other grassroots organization partners or the other CBO partners to really coordinate on our marketing education and outreach efforts. Uh, but you know, we'll be planning workshops, uh, providing input and providing feedback on the program to the program administrators to ensure equi equity within the uh, implementation of the program. Also anything from like creating social media content uh, to developing community outreach curriculum, uh, there's a lot of administrative work, like invoicing, reporting, managing budgets, and working with other managers at SEHA to develop different type of stakeholder um, engagement approaches and strategies. So it looks like many things. It could be lots of meetings. It could be a lot of focus time where I'm sitting and researching or, or writing or, or sending emails um, or having phone calls even. And yeah, and there's been some opportunities for in-person engagement, doing workshops with tenants and, and renters, talking about the program, um, teaching them about the benefits of the program, the way their bills will change and um, how they'll receive direct financial benefits from the solar on their rooftops. So yeah, those are, that's kind of like what a day looks like uh, in a nutshell, but it, it varies, it really does. I think it's so exciting though, because you're really at the forefront and trying to make something happen and being able to see that change directly, because I'm sure that every time you guys make a sale, I don't know if that's <laughs> how, what you, you would call it. Um, it's like you really get to see people's lives change because of it, because there, there are benefits to it besides lowering greenhouse gas emissions, right? It's like people get to save on their bills. And um, have you ever get, get to see any of these projects come into fruitation at all? I know you've only been um, in your yeah. role for five months, but I'm just curious about the results that you've seen so far? Yeah, so we have over 400 active applications or basically like projects in the works. So these projects are moving forward. They're going to put the solar on these multifamily affordable housing um, properties. And we have, I think, over 50 projects that have been completed. So they're, they're done. The solar's there. The tenants are receiving those um, solar credits on their energy bills, thus saving the money. And yeah, I think um, it, it's seeing, it is cool to see it come to fruition because you get to see that that's the end goal is like the impact that it has on renters and tenants. There's so much nitty gritty, like technical work that happens beforehand, mm -hmm. um, legal work and a lot of outreach and just like administrative work that gets to the point to where the solar is up, it's operating and working class people get to see those uh, savings on their energy bills, which really to some folks, it could be, uh, you know, it could decide whether or not they have food on the table. They don't have to decide what bills to pay that month. They can make their rent because the SOMA program helps shave off $40 off their energy bill. And so that's what we're seeing too, is 45 to $60 on average is being um, shaved off of tenants' energy bills, which is, you know, it might not sound like a lot to some people, but to others, it could be like life-changing. So yeah. yeah, that's why I'm just, I, I think that it's like the outcome that we all like have to remind ourselves that we're working toward is that it's for environmental justice communities, it's for renters. Um, and yeah, the impact that it has on these people's lives, it's real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so awesome. Um, because I'm in a totally different industry, like corporate. So we're so detached mm. from like everything that happens. And then even to get yeah. something to happen, it's like, mm. is it going to take five years or is it going to happen yet? So Oh, right. I just love that you, you get to see the impact directly. Um, mm. And so I know you mentioned in your day-to-day, -day, uh, there's a lot of different hats that you're putting on. And so um, what would you say, which mm. skills that you have have helped you to become successful in your current role? Yeah, I would say for any kind of program management role, um, in being a part of any kind of implementation of a program as big as SOMA. Um, and I didn't mention before, but it is a $1 billion program. It's funded up to $1 billion um, and it's over 10 years. So it's a very large, complex program. So many stakeholders and, and uh, organizations, people involved. Um, I would say 
project management um, is huge. You know, being able to work with people and teams, uh, track budgets and manage those budgets and really ensure uh, deliverables are met. So being able to manage work streams and workflows. And, and I think a lot of this work too has been streamlining efforts, like identifying opportunities for improvement and making uh, the, the program just more efficient. And, and by becoming more efficient, it becomes also more impactful. You know, if there's ways that we can, um, yeah, move the work forward in a more more efficient way that just doesn't waste our time, doesn't waste the capacity of grassroots organizations or the program administrators. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a great skill to have if you're able to like kind of problem solve in that way um, and identify solutions or, or propose alternatives to help make processes just run more smoothly. Um, I would also say like communications has been huge, um, whether that's be able to communicate effectively written uh, in written work like emails or drafting up um, social media content or communications through letters, uh, but also be able to meet with folks and, and communicate clearly uh, about the program, the benefits um, and how it works. Like I think just communication is such a big piece and um, also partnership development, so be able to build relationships with other stakeholders that are involved in the program or or with property owners uh, so that they are on board with the program and, and want to you know, apply and, and be a participate in it. And then last but not least, I would say education and outreach skills are also important. So, you know, if you have some kind of background teaching a lesson or understanding of different kind of frameworks for developing um, activities or lessons, uh, whether that be like the 5E model or uh, popular education, I think just having come some of that experience and in, and in, in whether being a teacher or or in popular education where you're both the teacher and the learner at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and outreach, you know, be able to uh, meet the communities where they're at and do that in a way that's meaningful and culturally relevant. So that requires like, you know, being out there in the community or doing your research and talking to the right folks so that you're not just coming in and telling people about this program or about the solutions that they should be uh, using for their own problems. Like they know more about their pro own problems than anyone else. And yeah. <laughs> they're the ones with all the wisdom for the solutions. And so, yeah, I'd be able to like outreach to communities in a way that is really meaningful and and driven by wanting to serve them, like truly serve them and not just, um, you know, check a box on your program requirements. Like we reached out to the community, we did that, it's done. It's more like, how can we involve the community in decision-making processes so that at the end of the day, this program's really serving them and meeting their needs. Oh, yeah. my heart just grew <laughs> from you telling me all of what you're doing. It's so great. I think, um, something that's really unique that you get to do is really just interact with people and communities. Cause I feel like mm. from some of the other people that I've interviewed so far, it's still very behind the computer all the time and mm. just doing what you mentioned, like trying to check boxes out <laughs> to get some yeah. stuff done. And so I love that you mentioned that being in this type of role, especially a nonprofit, you are really mm. driven by wanting to serve the people and the community and really wanting to do what's right. what's the right thing to do instead of just oh I have to you know so mm. oh, what a breath of fresh air <laughs> it's so nice I'm uh, glad yeah uh, um I was gonna ask uh so why is it that you chose this career path in particular oh that's such a good question sometimes <laughs> it's like did I choose this career path or did it choose me yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah I mean I, I would say like where this all, like my kind of environmental environmental justice, climate change journey began back in high school when um, like many other folks and students, I, I took an AP environmental science course and had an amazing teacher. <laughs> he, he was like a mentor and like an uncle to me. 
And there was this trip that he organizes each year. It's like an eco tour. And that year it was the Galapagos Islands. It was, um, I spent a year of fundraising, saving, um, and we went on this trip. It was my first time actually leaving the country. And it was just kind of like mind blowing. Like I left this bubble I'd been in my whole life in the Inland Empire and, and SoCal. And it was just like seeing these islands and the fragile ecosystems and animals I'd never seen any before in my life, like the giant tortoises and <laughs> iguanas and uh, crawling on the beach and the blue-footed boobies, the, the birds out there. It's just, it was so incredible. And the mangroves. And I was like, wow, I really, you know, I want future generations to have access to this, to appreciate this and protect it. So for my children, my grandchildren, you know, what can I do now to protect it? And that was kind of like the the genesis or the beginning of my like path on um, wanting to work in the environmental space. And then over time, um, really I shifted from like being interested in the sciences and doing like research more to the human side of the work. And so that's where I got way more interested in environmental justice and, and policy, um, because at the end of the day, that's policies can really decide lead to either suffering and harm of communities or benefits and and protection of of, of communities and so i just i shifted from like you know i still care about all the plants and the animals and and the planet itself but more to like human focus and, mm -hmm. and being people centered and community centered and so i mean that was kind of that shift and it was over many years and being involved in many different jobs and organizations uh, but it led me now to being just so passionate about the EJ movement and and the work that Seha does and that I get to be a part of and, and support in my role. So uh, that's a little bit of like why I chose it. But sometimes it's like, I feel like it chose me. Like, you know, <laughs> I, it, one thing leads to another. Um, you know, you just take that first step and apply to a job or go to a meeting or have like an informational interview with someone. And it kind of shapes and informs your career path. Very yeah. Much so. And yeah. I think it really does depend on the person itself. It's like, I think one of the best mm. advice I've gotten when I was in school, I was like at this mm. conference by myself and I was like scared to talk to everyone, but I just managed to talk to someone and sit next yeah. to a stranger during lunch. And he was like this older guy ready to give his wisdom. And he was just, at, he was saying, you know, you can do whatever you want in this industry. The hardest part is figuring out what to do because there's just so many things to do. And yeah. I feel like that's so understated. It's like, you can, what does sustainability mean? And it means something different to everyone. Um, mm -hmm. And then figuring out your bucket and instead of focusing on what I should do, do what you want to do. And I feel like mm -hmm. when you're in school, sometimes it's really hard to figure that out because you're surrounded by your peers mm -hmm. who might be so focused on this one aspect, like the science aspect. And then you're mm -hmm. like, maybe I should just be doing the sciences because everyone else is doing the sciences. And then right. you start, I think maybe it's just what happens as you get older, like, or after school, it's like you start having these inward um, conversations with yourself. Like, who am I? What do I really mm -hmm. want to bring to the world? And then right. from those conversations with yourself, you figure out that there is a pathway for you in this industry. Mm. And so um feel like anyone out there is stuck, have an inward conversation with yourself and you'll figure yeah. it out. Yeah, I call that, we always, uh, in previous roles, we, we would talk about finding your why. Mm. Like, why is it that you do what you do? Like, what mm. legacy or impact do you want to leave on this earth? Um and a lot of times, you know, you can do that through many things, not just your career, but a lot of times it is like, what is your career, your profession? And how can you make an impact? Um, and I feel like, yeah, any career could be mission driven if you if you make it to be. And, um, you know, at some point, I feel like well, I've heard it before, but like at one point, every job is going to be a climate job or every job yeah. is going to be an environmental job because every industry, part of our society, like, contributes to this like global system this climate system and so whether you're like harming it or making it better it's like any job you're in or any organization you're with has an impact like on people yeah. on the planet so yeah I like the way you framed that <laughs> like <laughs> go forward and follow like your your inner voice that why your north star mm -hmm. and we are reaching at the 20 minute mark but yeah just um before we head off do you have any 
advice that you'd like to give anyone out yeah. there who's looking to be in the same industry and role as you? Yeah, I would say it's very simple, but I would say just if, even if you don't know what to do yet, just do something. Like, I think there's this um, uh, analysis paralysis is what people call it, or this like fear that keeps you from even taking the first step. Mm -hmm. And you just need to get out there. Like whether that's, I'm going to go read that book. I'm going to go to this club uh, meeting. I'm going to go to that public forum. Um, I'm going to go to this networking event. I'm going to reach out to this professional. I'm going to apply for that internship or that job, whatever it is and looks like. And this goes beyond careers. It's like even just starting a new hobby. It's like pick up that guitar or just start painting. Like you don't know whether you're good at it until you start doing it, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, as simple as it sounds, my advice is like really just take an action. Like what can you do today? Like, or by the end of tomorrow, <laughs> if you yeah. want to give yourself some time to think about it, but just taking that first step, you'll, you'll realize you know, so, sooner or later that you'll realize sooner that way than not taking any action, if that makes sense. If you just spend all the time in your head or just like doing constant research or thinking and talking about it, just like do something. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll often find that through different internships, volunteering, jobs, like you'll find things, you'll realize what you don't like more than what you like. Mm -hmm. And at some point that narrows it down um, and you'll kind of hopefully end up in the right um, role and, and industry that fits you and your interests and your goals. But yeah, I would say just take that first step. Like I said earlier, follow your why, like figure out what that why is and really stick to it. Because then if plans change, like you lose the job, you didn't get the internship, they let you go or, you know, something crazy, you have to move or life happens. If plans change, you don't change the the goal. Like your goal stays the same. The plans will always change. Um, no, I don't think I know anyone in the professional world who has a linear career path and has just gone from like this role. And I immediately landed my dream job after college. And then I just moved on up and now I'm the director. And <laughs> I think people <laughs> just like go all over the place, switching roles, functions, industries, people take breaks and go back to school and do part-time work. Like it, it just, I feel like as long as you keep to your why and your ultimate like purpose, it, it's okay when plans change. Like you won't, you know, you won't be as uh, as uh, stressed or or torn when something doesn't work out. You know, so those are kind of like my takeaways uh, for anyone that is just starting out in their career, and know that you're not alone. I think that's the last piece too. Like yes. we, we've all we've all been there. Your idols, your career idols, your favorite people, they all started from somewhere. <laughs> exactly. Thank you so much, Taylor, for being here again. Truly appreciate. Yeah you and hope that you guys out there learned something and so if you do want to find tyler i'll put his deeds in the description um but thank you so much yeah thank you i appreciate it it's been great